Hello and welcome to the Adipec AI webinar powered by Energy Connect. Among the mega trends reshaping industries and societies at an unprecedented pace is artificial intelligence or AI. The good news is that AI is projected to contribute up to US dollars 15.7 trillion to the global economy by as soon as 2030, according to PwC. And the even better news is that recent advancements in AI technologies and its integration into the energy systems are reshaping the energy sector with the AI energy nexus, creating significant opportunities to accelerate the energy transition. Now, industrial AI today offers the energy sector several pathways to transform how we produce, distribute, and consume energy. During today's webinar, we aim to explore these themes and a lot more, including the promising potential of AI to drive economic and industrial transformation, highlight the integration and impact of AI solutions while addressing AI's increasing demand for energy and other emerging challenges. And to do that, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today for this fantastic webinar. Saravan Penubarthi, the Chief Technology Officer at AIQ. Elena Lucatini, Engineering and Technology AI Director at Baker Hughes. And Hector Roca, Glad to be here. Managing Director. Thank you. And Hector Roca, Managing Director and Global Gen AI Leader of Energy at Accenture. Glad to be here too. Before we begin, some very quick ground rules and housekeeping. Uh, we have a fantastic house today with nearly 600 registrations. So it's very important for all of you to sort of participate in this webinar and we look forward to receiving your questions for our esteemed panelists today. You can do that by asking your questions in the Q&A box that you see uh, to the right of your screen. And we will try and, and answer as many of those questions as possible. Keep them coming. And that takes us to our first question, which is to all of you. Uh, with so much going on within the, the artificial intelligence uh, domain, how can AI help support the energy industry to become more sustainable and meet its uh, Paris climate goals? If uh, you would like to answer first, uh, Elena. I'm mute, okay. Uh, so this is a very relevant question. And uh, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement calls for a significant reduction in greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And uh, the energy industry stands at the critical junction uh, as we face the dual challenge of meeting the world growing energy demands while drastically reducing carbon, uh, carbon emissions. AI, so artificial intelligence, has emerged as a powerful enabler that can support the energy sector in navigating this transition towards uh, sustainability. By improving efficiency and optimizing overall operation, I think AI is really playing a pivotal role in the industry, uh, in the industry transform. And let me outline uh, a couple of examples from Baker Hughes where artificial intelligence is really making a direct impact on machinery operations and services as well. And uh, uh, within the energy industry is helping uh, to lower emission and promote uh, sustainability. So today uh, at Baker Hughes, we are leveraging the power of AI and, ma and uh, machine learning across our portfolio to help customers unlock the value in their data, drive safer energy and more intelligent operation that supports their sustainability objectives. Uh, but uh, AI, ML, and also predictive uh, analytics only work with quality data. Therefore, uh, we focus on the mission critical process of identifying and extracting good data from our customers' operation. By combining them with the deep OEM knowledge, uh, with AI and, 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 and ML analytics, 
results. Uh, we help customers uh, reduce equipment failure and keep equipment performing uh, at its optimum level. Couple of real example and use cases. Uh, number one is uh, the Baker Youth Tri Center from our gas services business uh, that monitors over 1,800 critical pieces of equipment uh, in facilities across the group. Here, advanced analytics enable our engineers to diagnose potential problems and recommend solutions, optimizing maintenance strategy and improving operation efficiency. In this case, AI can monitor equipment performance and can predict failures before they happen, reducing downtime and ensuring that assets operate at peak efficiency. And, and by improving the longevity and the efficiency of equipment, uh, AI contributes uh, to lower uh, uh, operational emission. Uh, another use case uh, is the Vecchia uh, uh, maintenance optimizer uh, solution. Uh, this is a powerful application of artificial intelligence uh, in the area of predictive maintenance, uh, which directly improves uh, uh, machinery efficiency and reduces unnecessary emissions. AI-powered system can analyze real-time data from equipment, such as, for example, sensors embedded in compressors, pumps, turbines, to predict when components are likely to fail. And by identifying potential, potential issues before they lead to breakdowns, operators can perform maintenance at optimal times, avoiding unscheduled downtime and also keeping equipment running uh, efficiently. And this is critical for reducing emission because, because uh, malfunctioning equipment often consume more energy and operates uh, uh, less efficiently and also increase fuel use uh, and so greenhouse gas output. The last example uh, I would like to highlight here from our, uh, from our portfolio is a, a brand new application called Carbon Edge. This is built on Cordant, uh, and it is a digital end-to-end uh, -end solution that connects uh, uh, subsurface and surface data across uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage infrastructure with the goal of mitigating risk, uh, optimize operations, and streamline reporting for a CCUS project. In this, uh, in this case, AI improves uh, the design and the operation of uh, carbon capture system which are really essential for mitigating uh, emission from industrial processes. Uh, but AI uh, can also help uh, to optimize uh, the energy using carbon capture process, uh, reducing costs uh, and reducing energy intensity, making CCUS a more viable solution for decarbonizing uh, energy intensive uh, industries. So this application that I just described uh, uh, of AI uh, aligned with the Paris Alignment goal of uh, limiting global warming by driving efficiency and reducing emission across uh, the energy sector. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, for that very comprehensive overview. And you uh, raised some very important uh, points, I think, which we will dive deeper into during the next uh, few set of questions. Uh, Saravan, so going over to you, um, AIQ is a pioneer of AI in the industry. How are you helping support the, the industry towards the energy transition? Yeah, so yes, I think a couple of points here to start with. At AIQ, we have the core philosophy of AI for energy and energy for AI. So what we have done in the last four years, we have created around more than 14 products across the areas of efficiency, sustainability, safety, and predictive maintenance. And one such couple of use cases where we have a strong example how we are really improving the sustainability in real time is a product called as RoboWell. So RoboWell actually optimizes the production of the wells in real time, where we are taking the journey from augmented intelligence to autonomous operations with less of an emissions. This is such a great example of how AI can be integrated with existing operations, not only to reduce the emissions, but also to operate the wells in a sustainable manner. The second great example of one of such use case, which we productized and currently across the operating companies in the region is a product called as EmissionX. So as they always say, you cannot mitigate something you cannot monitor. So what we are doing with Emission X, we're actually monitoring the emissions in real time across the industry, right from upstream to downstream. And also we are forecasting in real time the emissions coming from specific instruments so that you can not only monitor them, but also you can forecast them what's going to happen in the next four years with those particular emissions so that we can take specific actions. So for us at AIQ, we strongly believe that to run sustainable operations, we need to improve the 
efficiency of the existing operations, not only from the augmented intelligence point of view, but also from the autonomous operations by leveraging artificial intelligence. That's really great to know. And Hector, Accenture's got like a really a big picture overview of the industry. And while AI has been uh, has been used by the industry for, for quite some time, what has changed and how do you see the, the sector uh, supporting the energy industry? Absolutely. No, thank you very much for the question. Um, so it has changed. It has changed uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a lot. Um, so from if we go back all the way to digital transformation, uh, you know, maybe a decade ago, when companies tried to digitalize absolutely you know, everything that they could because there was a really big promise of, you know, of unlocking value. Um, there was a really big, uh, big push into generating data. Uh, then the next question was, how do you actually get use of that data? And you know, how do you actually earn the value of that, of that data? So then AI came into play um, several years ago, and, uh, and there was a lot of uh, use cases being proved out here and there, um, with uh, uh, many of them being you know, in, uh, in, in the use case land, which I call right? Um, and then trying to, to trying to scale those AI projects, uh, you know, it was it was uh, a bit challenging, and you know, trying to uh, to unlock uh, and to uh, to really measure the value is not necessarily easy. Um, however, now we come into a completely new area with Gen AI, which we can you know really do things absolutely and completely different. And now I think uh, the industry has learned very well. You know, through the digital transformation, through the AI uh, years, and now with Gen AI, companies are truly focusing on uncovering value, and uh, and I think that's a, that's that's a really exciting times. Not only because the technology can now actually do things entirely different and just completely reinvent the way we work, uh, but also I believe the industry has already embraced you know the new uh, the new uh, the new mindset on on how to actually un unlock value out of this. That's really interesting to hear. And obviously with AI being branded as a catalyst for change within the energy industry and beyond, uh, we can see that it's not just helping make the industry more efficient and smart, let's say across uh, operations or in, in smart grids, but it's also making it more sustainable with, with uh, lower emissions. And you all touched on various uh, use cases like some examples. Is there anything more specific that uh, you would like to elaborate? Uh, going back to you, uh, Saravan, starting with you. I think there are three specific use cases uh, where actually we can directly focus on reducing the emissions, especially in industry leveraging AI. The first thing is obviously production optimization. So production optimization use case where we use artificial intelligence, not only to reduce the emissions, but also to improve the production in real time. So this is one such use case where you have operations across the upstream operations, not only in onshore, but also in offshore as well. So this is where AIQ has successfully able to commercialize the product, especially in our last four years of journey, not only taking a smaller set of data, but broader set of data across the rigs and the belts to start with. The other area, as I told you, where there is a huge potential of reducing the emissions is on the emissions monitoring and forecasting use cases, which are able to, uh, this particular use case is not only specific to upstream, but also the downstream set of operations itself. And last but not the least, one other area which is on the efficiency in terms of operating the wells and the rigs, especially on the drilling use cases, where you can actually optimize the drilling operations in real time, which is only possible with the advent of AI right now, because what we can do right now is we can actually detect the right false positives to take the right set of decisions in real time by optimization. So these are some of the three use cases where I see there is a direct impact on lowering the emissions specifically in the industry using AI. Great. And uh, Hector, if you would like to add to the discussion. Yeah, I know. I 100% agree. I think uh, so. To me, there's, uh, you know, two really big issues tied to lowering emissions. Right. So so one of the major uh, things that the energy industry needs to focus is on methane. I mean, so it's either methane or or CO2. Right. Those are the major the major two big uh, big issues in terms of the emissions themselves. Uh, my colleagues here have talked about, you know, like a lot of, you know, the efficiencies of the, uh, of the assets, which is extremely important because some of these assets may leak, uh, may leak methane, right? And that's one of those things that just goes very, uh, very invisible 
uh, to our eyes. So this is a, this is super super critical. Uh, but you know, AI in terms of uh, the use cases specifically, you know, like I, uh, AI, it's it's super uh, super critical to try to optimize, uh, you know, the flurry and uh, and detect uh, and detect leaks. So I think uh, that's uh, that's a really big. Uh, big area where, where the technology is actually uh, moving into the right direction and where the direction needs to be, right? That, that, that those emissions, as, 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 uh, as most of you guys know, methane is 80 times more powerful than, than CO2 in, in, in terms of uh, their, their global warming potential, right? In, the, in a short period of time, about 20 years, right? on a longer period of time, of course, CO2 stays in the atmosphere a lot longer. But, uh, but methane is, uh, is one of those, uh, those gases, which is uh, like extremely intense in a very short period of time. And as an industry, methane is one of those things that we are fully responsible of. So, so flurry, you know, controlling the flurry and controlling the venting, the venting and on the CO2 uh, emissions is basically uh, what my colleagues have mentioned in terms of how do you become uh, a lot more efficient and, and, and do less with more, yes, do more with less. Absolutely. And Elena, your perspective from from Baker Hughes, a leader in 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 terms of energy technology. So I'm very happy to discuss uh, the critical role that AI is playing in reducing emission. That is also very much aligned to the investments of Baker Hughes in new technologies. And uh, as we face uh, the pressing challenge of climate change, AI is proving to be one of the most effective tools uh, in creating innovative uh, data-driven solutions that help lower our environmental footprint. I would like to share a couple of use cases uh, uh, from Baker Hughes where uh, AI uh, implementation is really making uh, a tangible difference in reducing uh, emission. The first use case uh, speaks uh, about efficiency increase uh, in, uh, in uh, one of our pipeline customers. Uh, uh, so at Baker Hughes, uh, we have uh, a set of solutions where AI-driven system uh, can monitor critical equipment like uh, compressors, pumps, and turbines, uh, which are essential in oil and gas processes. So by optimizing these operations, uh, we are seeing reduction in the uh, unnecessary burning of fuel and a decrease in uh, greenhouse gases uh, emission. So when we monitor uh, such data set, uh, we may found, for example, that many gas turbines in power generation are not really operated at their uh, best efficiency point. And then we are using uh, AI and machine learning on purpose uh, to learn from machines and let us model them uh, with higher accuracy and, uh, and much faster execution time. AI in this case uh, helps us in learning from historical trends understand uh, engine degradation and predict uh, its future performances. This is uh, the case uh, of, uh, as I mentioned, one of our pipeline operator customer uh, that was looking uh, at ways to reduce pollutants, specifically CO and NOx, uh, but also greenhouse gas emissions uh, like CO2. And the question from the customer was, uh, how can I improve efficiency without impacting uh, hardware and investing, uh, uh, in, in, uh, having CapEx investment? The solution was uh, we recommended is implementing Carbon Optimizer. Uh, this is a suite of digital solution that is uh, based on AI and machine learning uh, uh, that for this pipeline customer resulted in 1,200 metric, on, uh, metric tons of CO2 saved uh, in, in one year. And this is more or less equivalent to 500 uh, tons of fuel consumption. And as you may understand, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, significant because the reduction of CO2 uh, has been uh, like 5%. Uh, uh, so it's in one year only. And also, we proved that that implementation of this digital solution can lead uh, up to 97% uh, extended operation with really, really low uh, pollutants level. Uh, as uh, many of us uh, uh, are saying, uh, data availability and uh, artificial intelligence are transforming the way we operate machinery, uh, making uh, process more efficient, uh, but also reducing uh, energy consumption and ultimately uh, lowering emission, uh, unlocking uh, uh, the full potential for, uh, for efficiency. Very briefly, a second use case, uh, I think it's, uh, it's still very relevant uh, to the conversation, uh, is about emission monitoring. Um, 
AI-powered emission monitoring system, uh, as known as PEMS, provide a real-time view uh, of emission level across uh, facilities. These help companies quickly identify leaks, equipment malfunctions, or operational inefficiency that may lead to higher than expected emissions. Early detection through AI-driven uh, insights and analytics ensures that companies can act fast, reducing both their emission and their uh, impact on the, on the environment. So to conclude, uh, I would say that AI is not only uh, revolutionizing how we operate machinery in the oil and gas sector, but also it's critical in, in driving down emission. So from predictive maintenance that keeps uh, equipment running uh, efficiently to optimizing drilling uh, to refining operation, AI, uh, I think, is making it possible for the industry to balance the demand for energy with the urgent need uh, to reduce its uh, environmental impact. Thank you. Some excellent examples there of uh, AI at work in, in ensuring the pathway to a low carbon future. And this is also something that we will get to see more of. Real world examples of AI at work at Adipec this year. Uh, more of that later. Uh, we'll just go to an audience question that we've received. Uh, and let me read it out. So how might the integration of generative AI with digital twins influence future energy policies and regulatory frameworks? Hector, if you would like to answer that. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I can comment. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think uh, there's, a, there's a big difference between the, the digital twin world where we used to hear and live uh, for the past several years and, and what Gen AI is today. Right? So the, gen, the, the digital th the twin specifically is getting, you know, uh, as, as the name mentions, you know, just a, a replica of what the machine is. So you can actually do a lot of testing, etc. However, uh, you know, Gen AI is completely, uh, completely a, a new game, right? So Gen AI is taking and leveraging, right, what uh, the, digi the digital twin was was doing, and what Gen AI can do is actually streamline every piece of the work stream along, you know, in this case, for example, the asset management, right? So it it is it is about doing the work, right? So Gen AI can get the work do and can get the work done. Uh, versus just the mon versus just the monitoring part, and maybe some you know alerts, some alarms, etc. So that one gen what Gen AI does, it's taking this it streamlines into a workflow. Uh, you can have different Gen AI agents doing specific tasks, talking to each other, and having, of course, the big uh, the big concern right now is is the human being you know in the loop. How much the human should be in the loop? And of course, for industries like ours, uh, the human must be or many. And many humans must be in the loop to ensure that this is a uh, that 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 uh, Gen AI and AI are doing the, the the work that it's supposed to be doing. Now, in terms of how does that influence regulation? That's actually a topic uh, which is a uh, is very interesting because you know in terms of how much do you actually trust the machines to to uh, to streamline workflows and to to uh, to execute on on, on a specific task that human used to do. That's a that's a very a very interesting question. As you know, how much do we trust the machine? And here it becomes as as the world keeps on progressing towards this direction. I do believe right now, right now we are very conscious, and we should be conscious, and we should have the human in the loop. As things progress, and we start getting uh, more use cases and more success stories, and we trust you know the machines more, then then it's going to to be a you know potentially a big change in in uh, in the regulatory environment. As well. Great. Uh, Saravan or Elena, if you would like to add your comments on that. I think uh, at VIQ, CJ, we strongly believe that we are moving from digital twins to digital agents. So we have already started working on use cases where we believe that customers are really interested to talk to an agent to get their, whether this information on predictive analytics, whether know to understand the status of their devices in real time whether to even get the information of the analytics and to have a conversation with them. So I think I, do, I truly believe that we are moving slowly from digital twins, as Hector rightly said, which we are used to for past several years, to go to digital agents, which will replace the way we actually work in terms of not only from the streamlining of operations, but also from the point of view in terms of the operators and even the operations on the ground will work with the digital twins in future. So having said that in mind, AIQ has already started working on these kind of use cases 
where we slowly have transition between the digital twins and the digital agents. And these digital agents will be very specific to the use cases that we are working on, not just a broad set of use cases that we see for upstream or downstream, but very specific, as Elena rightly pointed out, in terms of drilling or production optimization or reservoir management or safety use cases for HSE. For example, uh, at AIQ, uh, we have uh, a product called a Smart HSE, which specifically focuses using computer vision to make sure that we analyze the images and the videos coming from the HSE point of view. And what we have done is we are trying to integrate that with Gen AI. So imagine the level of productivity that we have for those kind of use cases, which used to be a simple dashboards before, is now actually telling you the information much before it actually happens, especially in terms of the HSE events. So these are the kind of Gen AI changes that you will see for energy industry, which is very pragmatic and also very applicable as well. Coming back to the regulatory frameworks, I think as sector rightly pointed out, it is an area that is evolving. And as operators, as specific AI providers like AIQ, we strongly work with the regulatory frameworks, not only from the industry, but also from the regional point of view, to make sure that we, we walk the talk and walk hand in hand with the regulator, not to run forward and leave them behind, uh, which is normally the case in any other industries. But at least in the industry that we are operating in, I think we are fairly aligned with the regulatory frameworks in the regions to make sure that we take them along. Great. Now, moving on to the next topic, uh, which is about, you know, what drives many uh, in energy companies to, to move towards AI and embrace and adopt AI is uh, safety and efficiency. So could you talk to us about the way enterprise scale uh, AI can make energy operations uh, safer and more efficient across the value chain? Elena, if you would like to go first. Okay, so um, I think uh, as we face growing challenges uh, in ensuring global energy security while meeting sustainability goals, uh, we more and more turn to technology to refine the way we operate uh, as, as global organization. And AI is for sure at the forefront of this transformation, offering, uh, I think, unprecedented solution to enhance both safety and operational efficiency and has now become a vital tool in transforming uh, how we approach uh, a critical task, especially uh, for, for the energy sector uh, when we operate in remote uh, or even hazardous, uh, hazardous environment. So by automating, optimizing and monitoring operation uh, with limited human intervention, I think uh, AI is really driving the shift uh, toward safer, more efficient and sustainable energy production. Uh, Enterprise scale AI uh, with its uh, vast data processing capability and advanced uh, analytics potential is already uh, driving innovation across uh, both upstream, midstream and also downstream uh, uh, downstreams operation. And it enhances uh, decision making. Uh, it, uh, for example, optimizes uh, complex processes uh, and it also ensures uh, a safer uh, working environment. Uh, uh, ultimately, I think, low, uh, leading uh, to a, a more sustainable and resilient uh, uh, energy operation. I would like to highlight uh, uh, a couple of areas where at Baker Hughes we are supporting energy players uh, uh, making a direct, uh, a direct impact on their operation. Uh, the first example or the first use case uh, is about enhancing safety through predictive analytics and risk management tools. Um, as we all know, uh, safety is a paramount in the energy sector, uh, where uh, workers operate often in a hazardous environment uh, and also where uh, complex machinery uh, poses uh, significant risk. So uh, by using uh, predictive analytics, for example, AI can forecast machinery breakdowns, helping companies address maintenance issues before uh, they really become uh, uh, an accident. Uh, or, uh, or, or, for instance, uh, AI can detect uh, anomalies in pressure, temperature, or vibration data from, uh, from critical machinery, triggering what we call uh, preemptive maintenance activities uh, to prevent uh, dangerous failures. This, uh, this uh, for sure improves uh, worker safety by ensuring that uh, hazardous conditions are detected and also mitigated early where possible. A second example I would like, uh, and this is uh, I would like to highlight, and this is particularly uh, close to to my current uh, current work, uh, is about uh, AI-driven predictive maintenance for uh, demanded uh, facilities. This is another area 
uh, where AI significantly uh, enhances uh, the managed operation. Uh, and typically here, uh, AI-powered uh, predictive maintenance systems uh, monitor critical equipment uh, using sensors that uh, continuously collect operational data. And uh, by applying uh, machine learning algorithm to this, late, to this uh, data, AI can detect early sign of wear, corrosion, or even mechanical failure long before they become uh, uh, critical. And as you may understand, uh, in demanded operation, this capability is really crucial. And uh, since fewer personnel are, uh, are on site to perform uh, routine inspection, AI uh, become the eyes and the ears uh, of, the, of the operation identify maintenance need in real time and scheduling repairs uh, before failures, uh, uh, failures occur. And this is the case, for example, of uh, offshore platform, where uh, the cost of sending maintenance queue is very high, and they can greatly benefit from, uh, from AI ability uh, to uh, both predict when equipment will fail and recommend uh, optimal maintenance, uh, uh, maintenance uh, uh, input. The last example I, I want to bring uh, uh, is uh, uh, around uh, autonomous inspection, um, and uh, and this is one of the most probably the most transformative application of uh, enterprise scale AI, and uh, specifically for uh, for application in uh, in demanded operations. So traditionally, uh, inspecting equipment uh, such as pipelines or even offshore platform uh, uh, required human inspector to travel uh, to often remote or, or, or dangerous locations. With the AI, uh, this process can now be handled by autonomous drones and robots, uh, drastically reducing the need for human, uh, for human involvement uh, in potential hazardous, uh, hazardous tasks. These AI-powered robotic systems are equipped with advanced sensors and also with cameras, enabling them to perform inspection in a very detailed way. Uh, and also in hard to reach or dangerous uh, infrastructure. AI system very, very simply analyzes the data collected from this uh, inspection, whether it's images, temperature readings, or even ultrasonic scans, and can quickly identify some, of the, some sign of corrosion, structural damage, or even leaks, uh, as, as my colleague Zector was mentioning, the relevance of, of methane leaks. Uh, autonomous inspection then uh, not only improved safety, but also increased the frequency and precision of, of inspection. And these uh, uh, enable and allow uh, early detection of issues that could uh, escalate into more serious problems. Uh, and, and it's doing this uh, uh, while minimizing downtime and reducing uh, the likelihood of costly repairs or even uh, 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 environmental damages. And by the way, uh, you will uh, uh, have the opportunity to see this, uh, this technology in action at the Adipec venue in a couple of weeks' time uh, at Becker Yuk stands, uh, where uh, we will showcase our uh, autonomous inspection solution uh, that is already implementing uh, computer vision and AI for robotics uh, capabilities and technologies. Absolutely, looking forward to that. Uh, Hector, your thoughts on efficiency and uh, safety? Yeah, absolutely. I know I'm entirely and 100% uh, aligned with, uh, with Elena's example, really good examples. The only thing that I would like to add is uh, uh, what we see as well is in terms of, uh, of the training capabilities and matching, you know, what people need to do uh, when and how. And, um, and what we see uh, Gen AI and AI in general coming into play is when uh, uh, building on the examples from uh, from Elena, if you, if a technician or you know or a field engineer needs to go and do something on a specific asset or a machine, you know, uh, in many cases then not, you know, because because things fail unexpectedly and thanks to advanced uh, AI that Elena was mentioning, now you can predict a lot better. Now you can also really uh, send the right person with the right capabilities into into the job. But not only that, now in terms of the person executing the job, now you have you know, an AI agent telling the person specifically what needs to be done. So now the question comes here in terms of uh, safety operations is can we achieve the same uh, level of safety uh, by having people having a very strong solid foundation on the topic, but not necessarily being you know, the one and the only expert in the world 
to do this, but having Gen AI actually, you know, augmented this solid foundational, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge from, from a specific person to actually acknowledge that, augment that, and then just become basically the best, you know, and the most capable uh, technician in the world by having this augmentation. So, so definitely safety is one of those uh, those things that that is uh, is going to be a, a game changer in terms of, of course, all the documentation of you know, whether things need, uh, need uh, you know, a recertification or things like that, which, you know, you can imagine, a, you know, a refinery has 40 to 50,000 pieces of asset and, you know, things moving, et cetera. So then just tracking all of that and the contracts and, you know, the regulations, that's just going to be uh, very much possible with, uh, with uh, what we have on hand now. Absolutely, the world of endless possibilities. And Saravan, AIQ has emerged as a dominant player within this space. Your comments? I think whenever we talk about enterprise scale AI, it's not just about the number of use cases. As you rightly pointed out, CS, the opportunities are immense. But many companies are still trying to figure out to take this technology from labs into production. You still see a lot of companies even trying to make their solutions in labs in R&D, but unable to put them into the operations. The real value in the energy industry is not about the number of use cases we do pilots and POCs, is how many use cases have we really are putting in, out in the field to derive the maximum value, as Elena rightly pointed out about, about efficiency and sustainability. Today, what we have done in AIQ in our last four years of journey, we understood what are the right ingredients to do this enterprise scale AI. As I always say, the famous triangle, so we need three things to do a real enterprise scale AI. The first thing is obviously data. People say it's just data, but it's not data. It's annotated data. There are tons of data in industry, but there is no data if you don't put a meaning or a label to it for AI. So we need right specialists to put the data and annotate it. And obviously the second thing is we need right set of infrastructure, not only for training, but also to run the inferences. And obviously the third thing is we need people who understands the industry to build the models and not anyhow. And that's where in our little experience in AIQ in the last four years, we were able to successfully put 14 products into the production environment. And the reason for that is we were able to work with the right infrastructure providers and on the right use cases. Now coming back to efficiency and safety, the products that we really focus on, and I can take three examples. One of the example is AR360. AR360 from AIQ is called as Advanced Reservoir 360, which is the most complex and efficient reservoir modeling and simulation software available today. It's completely with AI and with the right set of dashboards the reservoir analyst going forward can only need one system that can integrate with any number of silo systems in the back end to derive the right analytics and intelligence. The other example that Alina touched upon on autonomous operations is RoboWell from AIQ. And where what we have done is we have really taken away the pain of manually adjusting the chokes in real time in both onshore and offshore, where the models that are deployed on the APC controllers on the edge of the wells is actually doing the operation of gas lift injection, and as well as the production optimization by adjusting the right choke level completely unmanned without a need of a human to actually supervise it. Now, obviously, the capability of the system has to be such that it has to be really 100% accurate for us to really believe in it and jump onto it. That's why at AIQ, what we have done is we run a longer set of data analysis rather than shorter set of data analysis because we always believe that taking a shorter set of data, you can obviously get the right accuracy but the test point is when you have broader sets of data and still able to get that 99.99% in terms of accuracy is the way to go. I think this is how we are trying to solve this enterprise scale AI approach, especially for the energy industry. Those are some excellent points. Uh, thank you, Saravan. We'll just go back very quickly to some audience questions that we are getting. Uh, please keep them coming. Thank you for your excellent questions. Uh, this one is specific for Elena. How is Baker Hughes using AI for oil well drilling operations? Yeah, I think uh, I, I may see where the question comes from, and I see the relevance for sure, as I mentioned throughout the, the other question of AI for, for operations. And there are uh, a few topics uh, that are uh, are keen uh, in, this, uh, in this transformation. The first one is, uh, as I mentioned, is pre uh, predictive maintenance. Uh, uh, the, one, the other one uh, specifically to drilling is the automation of drilling uh, uh, and the optimized uh, well planning, uh, including all the activities that goes around it. Uh, and last but not least, I think it's very important to mention the increase of, uh, of safety. Um, so at, at Baker Hughes, uh, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have a significant uh, um, uh, in, 
capabilities uh, in, the, in that area. Uh, for example, I want to mention Lucipa. Uh, Luc Lucipa is a solution that we launched more or less one year ago. And this is uh, a, a digital solution, AI and machine learning based, uh, that is uh, specifically focused on uh, automated field production solution, uh, focusing on the, uh, eliminating and reducing issues uh, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, safety, inefficiency, and, and operator risks. And, uh, mm, and uh, Lucipa, uh, in this case, uh, and Lucipa Automated Field Production Solution, deliver value to our customer through digital optimization and, and workflow orchestration. Because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, as you may all know, a significant number of oil and gas production operations are really currently performed manually. So this is, uh, for sure, a, a, an area where we will see soon and fast uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of progress thanks to this AI uh, enabled solution. Thank you, Elena. And we have a question for you, Saravan. Uh, are there any case studies for optimizing uh, simulation operations like uh, stimulation operations like oil well hydrofracturing and acidizing, which improve the effectiveness of these uh, interventions? I think what we have done specifically those areas of interpretations is we have developed the software called as Drive where we do the optimization in real time, not only for the simulation point of view, but also on the machine learning point of view. So today we are actually using three use cases in this specific area, one for the core analysis, where we do the forecasting and optimization. Another one is running for the simulation specifically. But one of the challenges that we see on the simulation is having the right access to the infrastructure. And that's why we are solving it using software as a service. Because AIQ is 100% SaaS provider of AI solutions. So we completely take care of the simulations and the real time machine learning operations analytics with the customer data sets. Thank you. And moving on to our uh, next set of uh, questions, which is, you know, the, the, the discussion has often centered around, obviously, the deployment of AI and the, the use of AI by the energy industry, but also whether the use of AI has become a victim of its own success. So what is the way forward in mitigating the significant increase in energy consumption uh, amid the rapid growth of AI technologies and the reliance of energy systems on AI to function optimally? Uh, Hector, if you would like to answer that, and then we go to Saravan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as you said, it's, uh, AI is becoming, uh, it's uh, creating its own, uh, its own issues. So the thing that I, I'd like us to, to set our mindsets is first, before you know this explosion of, of AI, Gen AI, it was the world was still needing a lot more energy every year, right? So we were in a, you know, in a, in a situation where we need to power the world, you know, and provide energy to the world uh, in the most sustainable way. Now, Gen AI comes into play and this just explodes that, you know, the, the, the amount of energy demand that, that we can actually that, that, that we can actually uh, uh, handle. So now, um, so the question is, okay, so now what, what do we do? So Gen AI is actually, uh, you know, doing a lot of great stuff for us and has a lot of the potential in terms of efficiency, safety, safety, et cetera. Uh, but now how do I, uh, the, the, the more we use Gen AI, the more energy we need and the more, you know, the more challenges we have. Um, I do think uh, the technology itself, and it's going to self-correct, the technology itself is just going to become you know, a lot more efficient. Right? The data centers will be will be self-regulated, and there will be you know the the hardware itself is just going to become you know smaller, more efficient, more energy efficient. But that uh, you know that that efficiency is and it's just going to drop you know at some point while while, while the while the demand keeps on increasing. So really, the the challenge uh, here is how do we ensure this uh, this uh, power areas of AI, like the big data centers and big uh, computing centers, can be you know, self-sufficient in, in, in terms of energy and you know, avoiding more of, of, the, of the impact to the overall uh, uh, consumption. Um, there's many different things that you know, can be done depending on where you are in the world, right? But, uh, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, and then you have the, also the, the issue of, of the transmission and the distribution of electricity, which is one of the the, the biggest roadblocks and the bitter, uh, biggest bottlenecks uh, that we have around the world. So, so now it becomes a question like these data and computing centers should be, you know, 
kind of working in isolation and being powered in isolation with a combination of renewable, uh, renewable or low carbon uh, energy. You know, maybe we may be thinking about, you know, uh, nuclear, uh, back to nuclear, maybe we be thinking about, you know, like, like powering this with, uh, with uh, self-generation with uh, natural gas. But um, definitely it's, uh, it's one of those things that it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a dual challenge that it's going to come into play very, very soon. So, Saravan, uh, I think this is also going to be a, a critical sort of question to address. As, like you said earlier, more uh, uh, use cases move from the lab and the uh, uh, R&D centers to the real world. What are your thoughts? I think, uh, CS, as you rightly pointed out, I think I'll go back to the statement that I made at the start of the webinar, which is energy for AI and AI for energy. Going forward, we cannot separate these two elements, right? I think this is one of such conundrum where I think the traditional approach to solve this is sector rightly pointed out to make sure we manage it at the source level in terms of providing the right energy. But on the flip side of it, which I always recommend is to do three things, which is always in our hands. The first thing is don't do AI for the sake of doing AI. Do AI where there is a real value. And obviously, don't create a solution and try to find a problem. I think that is step number one. The step number two is what I always preach and we also follow at AIQ is there is always optimizations that you can do at the training level as well as the inference level. So making sure there are some tweak in terms of technologies to make sure that we can use less of a compute for training and less of a compute for running with the right architecture in place. And last but not the least, the third thing that we can always do for the energy optimization is to have, again, use AI, especially in the power grid optimization and energy optimization phase where at least within the same level of energy production, we can optimize in a better way, which can reduce in less of the losses. I think these are the three steps that we can do, obviously, within our hands to make sure that we support the AI with the right energy needs. Absolutely, and I think uh, solutions and, and collaborations uh, such as these will be in spotlight at ADIPEC this year, where the focus firmly is on the transformational impact of AI on the energy sector. And Traditionally, always, obviously, ADIPEC has been a, a unique platform for collaboration and in bringing together diverse voices from across industries. And this year, that collaboration is really important as we explore AI and other emerging technologies and how they can make a difference in, in making the energy industry more efficient, resilient, and sustainable. Now, two weeks out, uh, ADIPEC is, is convening in Abu Dhabi with a major focus on the transformational impact of AI on energy industry. What are you looking forward to uh, at this event this year? Starting with you, maybe, Elena. Yeah. So uh, I think as we convene uh, at ADIPEC 2024, uh, the focus of, uh, uh, of the integration of artificial intelligence into the energy industry is, uh, is really exciting for me. And a few aspects uh, I will be looking forward to are, uh, first of all, uh, the AI-driven operational efficiency showcasing. As I mentioned, AI is expected to drive massive improvement in operational efficiency across the energy sector, and especially in the area of predictive maintenance, energy trading, uh, and optimization processes. So I'm really eager uh, to see real-world uh, use cases uh, and innovation in this area, and, uh, and particularly around the use of AI in managing complex energy networks and improving uh, the reliability of the assets. Another area uh, where I'm, uh, I'm very uh, focused uh, is the digital twins uh, and uh, autonomous operation. I think uh, the rise of digital twins uh, and uh, autonomous uh, operation, uh, especially if powered by AI, is a major trend as we speak. So these technologies offer the ability to model physical assets in real time and also optimize their performances. So it will be very interesting to see advancement in this technology uh, as, as they will be showcased at ADIPEC. Another area of focus for me would be uh, the startups and the innovation around AI. And I expect uh, the startup ecosystem around AI in the energy uh, being uh, really, really buzzing at Adipec. Uh, and I expect to see really fresh innovation uh, from uh, AI driven new companies. Another area I think it's also touched in one of the questions 
uh, is about uh, regulatory and uh, and ethical discussions i think uh, as we uh, as ai uh, become more and more integrated into energy uh, discussions uh, on regulation ethics uh, and also how we govern uh, so the governance around ai will become uh, will become uh, crucial and I'm curious to see how the industry plans to address uh, these issues, uh, and particularly uh, concerning, for example, transparency in AI algorithm, and also the long-term impact of automation on the workforce. And this is uh, also linked to um, areas of interest and in the, in the q and I was, I was reading before. Uh, so all in all, uh, the convergence of AI and energy at Adipec promises uh, really to uh, highlight game-changing technology that will shape the future uh, uh, of interesting. Another point probably uh, is about uh, uh, the energy AI exhibition and also the AI leadership roundtables. I expect uh, uh, this, uh, this session uh, showcase uh, uh, groundbreaking AI solution that are already driving change uh, in the energy, the energy industry. And these events, uh, along with the dedicated uh, AI energy AI theater that I know will be will be there, uh, will be really crucial in shaping future AI energy partnership uh, and also driving collaboration across uh, across the industry. Uh, Last but not least, um, the Creative AI Lab and also the Upskilling Lab promise to be really exciting, providing insights into AI role uh, in, in bridging the skill gap uh, in, the energy, uh, in the energy workforce. This session, uh, I think, uh, um, will have the opportunity to highlight how new technology are not only transforming operation, uh, but also uh, are creating the opportunity for the next gen uh, of, of energy professionals. And, uh, and I really look forward to engaging with other global leaders, uh, but also innovators and also top leaders at Adipec, uh, as we collectively uh, will explore uh, how AI can continue to shape uh, the energy sector for, uh, for the better. Absolutely. I think you outlined several important points there. It's not just the world's largest energy uh, event, but it's also this year with the, the brand new energy AI by Adnoc. Uh, I think there's a brand new experience for everybody to sort of experience. Uh, and, and Saravan, AIQ is a big part of that, that uh, new feature. I think IDPEC is always exciting CS. I think personally for me this year is, I'm really excited about three things, obviously. Uh, we have a new line of products that we'll be announcing in IDPEC the like new kind of innovations that we want to show the world. I think obviously we are very excited for that and the work is happening. The second thing which I'm really interested on is, uh, as Elena rightly pointed out, is obviously to understand not only from the other technology providers, but also from the operator's point of view, what's really happening in their AI point of the world. And the third thing, whenever we say ADPEC, I always remember the word collaboration. So ADPEC for us is all about collaboration. Now uh, we have a fourth pillar digital innovation approach. We always look it around in AIQ which is obviously working with the technology providers, the system integrators specifically coming from the industry and Baker is one among them as well. We are all partners in the game. And obviously the third thing is obviously specific startups who are trying to solve one unique problem. And then we want to obviously learn from them as well. And last but not the least is to sit with the operators themselves, the IOCs and the NOVs, NOCs and try to understand what's really happening in terms of the data challenges and how can we really collaborate with them, whether it's energy leaders or from the sessions that we are having in IDPEC. So for us, IDPEC is exciting and we are very, very looking forward. Right, and Hector, what are you looking forward to? Thank you so much. Uh, I can uh, just uh, agree entirely with uh, Saravan and Elena, and not to be repetitive, but you know, what I, one of the things that I'm uh, looking forward is this uh, complete mindset reinvention and uh, as many people get lost into what's actually hype and what is actually real, right? And how do we actually, coming back to the questions, how do we actually do these enterprises scale? Like this, I mean, these are really big challenges uh, because, you know, we are talking all about, you know, maybe AI can do uh, the job of half of my day, right? So then what am I going to do with, <laughs> with my half of my day? Like how, how are companies going to, to actually start shifting, you know, and reskilling you know the workforce as you as as the machines start taking over your work, right? Um, so these are you know really big questions. And when you really want to put these boots on the ground and really make it happen, 
then it becomes on a, a question on your talent, your HR, you know, like how, you know, workflows, you know, how, how do you entirely reinvent? So very looking forward to this uh, reinvention mindset in terms of going beyond, you know, and looking, you know, really, really broad to how would we actually tackle of all these issues. And uh, it's super exciting uh, uh, to have uh, people like Saravana and Elena and, uh, and uh, looking forward to that's really great. And then if we ask for all of you to, to sum up your expectations from Adipec this year in, in one word, what would it be, starting with you, Hector? Ah, that's a, that, that, that was a question I was not expecting, but okay, let me think. Um, uh, I will say uh, amazed. <laughs> let me pick that word. All right. And I think, Saravan, you spoke about collaboration. Is that something that you would... I think, I think I'll stick to that. Adipak for me is collaboration. And Elena? Yeah, I, I really love collaboration, but also I think uh, uh, innovation, because even if AI is already applied, so it's not a future, but it's really present, I think there is room for innovation, and I really look forward to it at Adipak. That's right. And we've got a bunch of audience questions. We will try and do uh, justice to them as much as we can. We are really short on time. Quick question for you, Elena, is how does the cost of running Gen AI models uh, act out and in terms of resourcing and deploying generative models? Yeah. So uh, first of all, the question on cost is particularly relevant, uh, but also um, uh, the, it tied uh, to me with with scaling up the solution because most most uh, in most cases we go for POC but the challenge is really making it to scale right uh, this is this is what is I mean at least uh, we are challenging now uh, I think there are various areas of, of cost contributors uh, the first one for sure is linked to human resources uh, uh, because develop this uh, uh, this model require a team of skilled data scientists, uh, but also machine learning engineers, uh, software developed uh, developers. Uh, so for sure, the cost of hiring and retaining this talent uh, can be can be really significant. Uh, and uh, and uh, to Hector point, uh, probably AI is gonna do half of my job, uh, but but there will be the need of different jobs that so far are really uh, are really critical, right? The other cost being more more um, from a technical standpoint, there is for sure the hardware cost uh, because uh, there is uh, a lot of requirement for uh, training uh, this model uh, can be that can be really expensive uh, both to purchase and to maintain. Uh, there is there is really the cost of data uh, collecting uh, pre-processing large uh, data set of data uh, can be time consuming and also very expensive. Uh, uh, and uh, and I want to mention also maintenance, uh, upkeeping, but also scaling and upgrading cost, uh, because as the demand uh, for more advanced model uh, uh, grow, uh, it grows uh, significantly also the cost uh, associated with uh, uh, running and deploying them. So these, for example, uh, require upgrading in hardware, uh, increasing the cloud usage, uh, uh, and also investing, in general, investing in more uh, advanced software uh, solution. We'll take one more question. Uh, it is for Hector. Whether do you think it's important for EPC companies to have an AI department? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, the question might apply not only to EPCs, but uh, to many companies. And the, que the, the answer here is, you know, and uh, my recommendation always is let's think about the business problem first. So let's think about first AI. Let's, let's just assume that currently technology can basically do anything for you, right? If you think about that and then you said, what are my actual business problems? For an EPC specifically speaking, is the big capital projects, right? Which are extremely complex and most of them tend to overrun in time and even over budget because of changes and because of, of things that unpredictably happen. Right? And because of sometimes the lack of integration of an EPC with the, the, with the, actual, with the actual operator. But you know, what, what I will think is the, the short answer is yes, there's lots of opportunities that we are actually uh, ourselves exploring with, uh, with EPCs. But, uh, but it's, it's more about, my message is more about you know, this, this business mindset of what's, what can be done better right? and how can you do that. 
And after that, you go and say, how much value can I get? Because there's a question of like, is it cost efficient? How much is it going to cost me? The AI. Let's not think about cost just yet. The second, the second step is thinking about the value. How much value are, are you thinking to uncover? It? And once you know the value, then we estimate the cost and you estimate the ROI, right? If the ROI makes sense, then, then you proceed. But, but that's, uh, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. And Saravan, very quickly going back to you, because to frame your earlier comment about don't necessarily invest in AI if it's not needed. Would you like to frame this response as well? I think uh, specific to the EPC, I think the answer is yes, because that's that's one of the area where I'm sure that having an AI-enabled knowledge will really help with the EPC providers to work with the oil and gas companies going forward. I think hands down the answer is yes, but going back to Hector and what I was saying before as well, I think in general, I think uh, AI is everywhere. I think it's inevitable. And especially in industry, the value is immense. But having said that, um, we should always build AI and look at the value and prioritization of the use cases first to start with before we're trying to jump into it because it takes a lot of time to move the solutions from the R&D labs into production. Given the effort and the time and the cost that is involved, it's better we put our money in the right areas. Elena, Hector and Saravan, thank you very much for this lively discussion and for your insights. It's been a pleasure talking to you over the last hour. And to all of you who joined us, our fantastic audience today, thank you for your excellent questions. We couldn't answer all of it, thank you. Uh, so the webinar today has come to an end, but the discussion hasn't. So please make sure that you secure your delegate passes by logging on at adipec.com forward slash conferences and continue the discussion and join all the action at Adipec in two weeks time. And a quick reminder that you can get comprehensive coverage of the energy industry at energyconnects.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Thank you.